Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. This is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, The End of Days. We're living in the last of the last of the last days. And I realize that there are some who say that we still have hundreds of years, it's not thousands of years left in existence here on this side of eternity. But I'm here today to tell you that that is simply not true. The end of days are upon us. We are living in those very last days. The days of tribulation are soon to come. And we have to prepare ourselves. We have to be ready for those days. Let us take a look at how Jesus described it. Turn with me please to Matthew chapter 24, verse three through 14. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Jesus' disciples were interested in what will take place in the end times, or as they put it, the end of the age. But why? Why were they so interested? Because they were desirous to know when the return of Jesus would take place. He hadn't even left yet, but already they were missing him. This is how we should be, longing for the return of Jesus. As Revelation chapter 22 verse 17 says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I attended a church service several years ago at a to listen to a speaker who, who was speaking at a church that I didn't normally attend. But during his message, he was saying that he's so sick and tired of people talking or preaching the return of Jesus because it gave the young people, it gave the teenagers no hope. Can you just imagine? He claimed that it gave the return of Jesus, gave the young people no hope. No hope to talk about the return of our Lord and Savior. Sir, that is our hope. Matter of fact, the early church looked so forward to the return of Jesus. They looked so forward to that day that they called it the blessed hope. We've lost sight of what really counts. The church has now come to believe that the things that we accomplish here on this earth, on this side of eternity, promotions, wealth, entrepreneurship, business, pursuing future goals, making a name for ourselves, and such things are what really, really counts. When in fact, this, this world and all the things of this world are just temporal. Can you just imagine teaching that our young people teaching them about the coming, the second coming of our Lord and Savior, gives them no hope. It's unbelievable. It's just pitiful, utterly pitiful. 
No wonder the Lord said that we are lukewarm, wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Revelation chapter 3 verse 17. But know this, this world and the things of this world, they're quickly passing away. They will soon be gone. Those things will not last forever. The disciples asked Jesus plainly, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So Jesus gives them a list of things to look for. He says, people trying to lead you astray, false messiahs claiming to be the Christ. You will hear of wars and rumors of war. But the end of verse 6, Jesus says, yeah, all of these things are happening. But guess what? The end is not yet. Yes, there's a lot of stuff going on around you. Strange things are happening. Things that are perplexing. But that is not the end. It is only the beginning of the end. So you are not to be alarmed. There are even more dreadful things that are waiting, waiting to come. Then he talks about nation rising against nation, kingdom rising against kingdom. He even talks about famines and earthquakes in various places, places where there have never been earthquakes before. They will begin to experience earthquakes. And even these things are still not the end, but only the beginning of the birth pains. So if these things aren't the end of days, then what qualifies as the end of days? Well, look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. To what? To tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many would fall away and betray one another and hate one another. It's tribulation. That is what just determines the end of days. When the days of tribulation begin, that is what qualifies us to say, this is the end of the end, the days. I want you to pay particularly close attention to what Jesus says in verse 9. At least look at how he starts out verse 9. He starts out by saying, then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Did you notice how Jesus starts that out? This, this, this is his discourse. He says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation. First of all, who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to his followers. He's talking to us. He's talking to the church. Then who is the they that he spoke about? Well, they are the world. They are the unbelievers, the haters. And lastly, what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the great tribulation. He's talking about the church being delivered up to tribulation by the world of unbelievers, by a world of God haters. I don't understand how the church don't understand that. They, they don't seem to comprehend that we're going through the tribulation. It's translated in plain English. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. How can you say that you're not going through the great tribulation when Jesus says that you are going through the great tribulation if you're one of his followers? So if you're a follower of Jesus, he has determined that you're going through the great tribulation. Here's the thing. The world's going to go through the tribulation with us. It's going to go through the uh, at least the poor and the deplorables. They're going to go through the tribulation as well. Why? Because the great tribulation is from man. When the ultra-rich wealthy usurp power and control of the world's government and bring the terrors of hell upon the whole earth. Right? So when I say, my, my brother Kenny, how, how did you come up with something like that? 
Well, let us take a look at what Jesus told the second to last church, the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. He said, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on who? On the whole world. And then he reiterates it. To try those who dwell on the earth. Isn't it a little bit strange that he only tells this church that? That he's going to keep them from that hour of trial. I mean, two churches earlier, the church in Thyatira, he said to, to them, he, to, he told them this, Revelation chapter 2, verse 19. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. They had love, they had faith, and they had patient endurance. But he did not say that he was going to keep them from that great trial that's coming upon the whole earth. Do you know why? Because that time of the great tribulation was not yet. But the church in Philadelphia, if not for their patient endurance, they would be the ones going through the great tribulation. But because of their patient endurance, Jesus said, he will keep them from that great trial. But I want you to focus on this. I want you to focus on what Jesus said at the end of the sentence. The hour of trial that is coming on the whole world and try those who dwell on the earth. It is not just the church, but the whole world. So those who are helping bring this to come to pass, you will be right there sharing in the suffering that is coming. You will not escape. They don't care about you. They say you will have nothing and you'll be happy, but you will own nothing. They don't want you to have nothing. Not only will you share the suffering of the great tribulation, but something worse is stored up for all those who do not accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's called the wrath of God that comes right after those days of great tribulation. But let us get back to the great tribulation in the church. I want us to take a look at the rest of verse 9. Matthew chapter 24, the end of verse 9. And put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. You will be what? Put to death. Why will you be put to death? For the name sake of Jesus. For the sake of the name of Jesus. This is part, this part here is not talking about the world. Neither is it talking about those who some might claim will be saved during the days of tribulation. Jesus in, in John chapter 15 verse 19, he says, If you were of the world, the world will love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Jesus declares that because we don't belong to the world, the world will hate us. And then he makes it clear. He clarifies it for us. If you were of the world, the world would love you. But as it is, we do not belong to the world. Therefore, we are hated by the world. Understand that neither Jesus nor the Bible are in the habit of talking to people who are not believers. He, he's not in the habit of addressing unbelievers or even those who will become, who are not believers now, but will become le le believers later. That is not how prophecy works. By and large, the Bible is written to and for believers, the followers of Yeshua, Jesus, the Son of the living God. Now, it mentions the end of unbelievers, but it only mentions the end of unbelievers as written to the saints 
for knowledge so that we can warn the sinner, warn those who are not following Jesus to come to Jesus before it is too late. Thus the Bible is written to believers and until you are a believer, the scriptures and his prophecies and promises do not belong to you. They belong to the believer. Now look at the next two verses, Matthew chapter 24, verse 10 and 11. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Many will fall away and many will betray one another. Not only will they betray one another, but they will hate one another. They will begin to hate each other. They used to love you, but now they hate you. Again, this is not the world. This is the church. Because it says, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. That is not the world that they're leading astray. No, the world is already astray. It is the church that will be led astray. And do you know why they will be led astray? Because the church do not read the Bible for themselves. Christians have no clue what is in the Bible. So some have never ever read the Bible for themselves. And that is why they will be so easily led astray because they do not know the scriptures. Then the false prophets who speak on behalf of God will tell them that they can live any old way that they want. God will accept you. You don't have to be holy. You don't have to be righteous. Because after all, God is desperate for followers. He's desperate for worshipers. And so he has no choice but to take what he gets. That's not the case at all. For God said in Malachi chapter 1 verse 14, I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. My name will be feared among the nations. God demands that his great name be feared and respected. He is not a desperate housewife. He is almighty God, a mighty, mighty warrior. Look at what God says in Psalms 95 verse 3. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. God is a great king. He is God of gods. He is Lord of lords. He is the great I am. He will not accept half-hearted worship. He will not accept halfway sacrifices. He demands the best. He demands the best from you. He demands the best from me because he is a great God. Therefore, God will not accept our lukewarm worship. So because of these false prophets leading many straight, look at what will happen. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. And because lawlessness will increase, the love of many will grow cold. Lawlessness will increase. Why? Because they have departed from the truth and thus have been rejected by a true and just God. God will not accept lawlessness either. Again, God is not desperate for worshipers. For those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So because of the false teachers who teach that you can live any old how you want and the things that God said that are wrong are actually antiquated now because our government and our society says that they're outdated because of all of that, lawlessness will increase. And when lawlessness increases, the love of many will grow cold. Lawlessness equals cold love. Why? Because one cannot serve two masters. Either we will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Matthew chapter 26, verse 24. But either way, the love of many will wax cold. It looks dark. It looks hopeless. It looks bleak. It looks like those days are so, so far gone that it's almost impossible. But the scriptures teach us that when it looks like there's absolutely no hope. There's always hope in the Lord. 
praise his name. And now look at the very next verse, verse 24, verse 13. But the one who endures to the end will be what? Saved. All we have to do is to hold on, grab a hold and do not let go. Endure to the end and we will be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance, that all gain eternal life, that all be saved. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine. God wants life, he wants blessings, he wants hope for us. That's what he has in store to give us, blessings and not curses hope and a future. That's what God has for us. Not death, not cursing, not despair, but life and life more abundantly. That is the reason why he came in the first place. Look at Matthew chapter 24 verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, never will be. Again, I ask the question, who is Jesus talking to? And again, it is the same answer to his followers. He's talking to us. He's talking to his church, the bride of Christ. The great tribulation is determined for the church. A lukewarm church, but the church nonetheless. It will be a time like never before and will never be again, but again, there is still hope in all of that hopelessness. Look at the next verse, verse 22. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. God takes pity on his people and he cuts those days short because of his elect. Because of the elect. Not because of the world, but because of the ones that he loved. The ones that he died for and the ones that he's coming back to get. He doesn't leave us there like orphans. He's coming back for us because he doesn't want to see us suffer. Look at what Paul writes to young Timothy about the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. That word translated difficulty is the Greek word tapelos. It means tribulous, difficult, harsh, fierce, violent. It is used two times in the New Testament. Once in Matthew chapter 8 verse 28 translated fierce when Matthew was described as the demoniac of the Gardarenes. Remember legion? Well, that's how Matthew described Legion, at least the man who Legion inhabited or demonized. He described them as fierce. The other scripture is the one that we just read, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Fierce times, troubled times, hard times, harsh times. So that verse, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, could be read in this way. Fierce, violent times of harsh difficulties will come in the last days. These, my friends, are very strong adjectives describing a certain time. And that time is here. That time of difficulties for the Christian is upon us. That time is now. We need to be ready for the return of Jesus. Not preaching against the return of Jesus, but preaching about the return of Jesus because the, the return of Jesus is about to take place. We have a blessed hope in Jesus. He will never leave us, he will never forsake us, but rather, he loves us. And because he loves us, he loves us so much that he's coming back to get us so that where he is, there we shall be also, and we will be with him forever and ever and ever. Are you ready for the return of Jesus? Have you made Jesus your Lord and Savior? So, if you have not, you can. All you have to do is to ask. If you would like Jesus 
to be your Lord and Savior. If you would like to be assured of being included when he comes back to make up his jewels, to get us, all you got to do is to say this prayer, a prayer of repentance. Believe it with all your heart and you will be saved. So if you want to be saved, if you want to be sure of eternity with Jesus, say this prayer and believe it. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would remember me when you come back, that I might be with you forever and ever. In Jesus' name, Jesus. amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But let me remind you, it doesn't just end there. That is only the beginning of your walk with Jesus. Now what you got to do is to live for him. How do you live for him? By praying, by worshiping, by spending time and reading of his words so you can understand who he is and what he expects of you. So get yourself a Bible. Read your Bible every single day. Find yourself a Bible-believing church. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he will find you doing what it is you should be doing. And if he does find you doing what it is you should be doing, you'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And there you'll be with him forever and ever. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more night, no more fear, no more hunger, no more thirst. For we will be living in a time of blissfulness with Jesus as our King, Jesus as our God. And all of our needs will be supplied. I hope to see you then, if not before. Well. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. The Lord bless you richly as you serve him as we wait patiently for his return. Tell somebody about the love of Jesus. Tell somebody about what he has done for you that they too may believe, that they too may be saved. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay